So how are you doing? Great. <laughs> I heard about three people. <laughs> if you could sum up your emotions over the last week into one word, what would it be? I'd like you to think about that just for a second. Turn to the person on your left or your right and tell them what that one word would be. You know, some of you might have used the word frustrated. Some of you might have used the word relieved. Some of you might have said confident. Others, nervous. Some would have said amazed. Others might say angry. Guarded might be a word. Optimistic. I got a text from somebody this week and they used the word scared. Disappointed, especially if you're a Michigan fan. <laughs> oh. Oh. Secure, maybe. Stressed. We were just talking this morning about how the holidays coming up are not always peaceful for everyone and uh, they give a lot of people a lot of stress. Motivated. Would might, might be a word that you used. Divided might be a word. Invigorated, maybe. Or hopeful. You know, whatever your word might be, I think God has a message for you this morning. But it helps if we understand the real picture. All right, the real picture. In 1900 B.C., Jacob, that he became known as Israel, went to live in Egypt with his son, his favorite son, Joseph. He took with him 70 people. 1900 B.C. 430 years later, in 1500 B.C., the children of Israel, the 12 tribes, followed Moses out of Egypt with an estimated population of 3 million. Not long later, Joshua conquered the land of Canaan with an army of 600,000 men. You can find that in Numbers chapter 1. Then just, uh, just a few hundred years later then, we see Solomon... Uh, David and Solomon, in their heyday, it was the, it was the, uh, the monarchy where the, all the kingdoms were together being ruled under one kingship. And in that day, Israel had an army of 1.3 million men. That was about 1,900 to 1,000 uh, B.C. In 586 B.C., 400 years after uh, Solomon, as the children of Israel chased after idols, Jerusalem was wiped out by Nebuchadnezzar and the, people, uh, the children of Israel, some of them, were exiled to Babylon. It's estimated that less than 150,000 people, Jews, survived the annihilation that came at the hands of of the Babylonians. They died through famine, they died through disease, they died by sword, but mostly they died because God had turned His back on them as they had turned their back on God. A hundred years later, those who had come back to help rebuild the temple uh, with a guy named Zerubbabel and Ezra and then later Nehemiah rebuilding the walls, uh, we're told that the total population was 42,360 people. There were 7,300 slaves. There were 245 singers. I don't know why they put them separate, but they did. If you know any musicians, maybe you know why. Where's Leslie? All right. 
Uh, 736 horses, 245 mules, 435 camels, 6,720 donkeys. Yeah, it's all in Numbers chapter 7, verses 66 through 69. Now, why am I telling you all this? Why am I telling you all this? It's because God's people in 500 years had gone from a, a, a population that had to have exceeded more than 5 million. They had an army of 1.3 million. So you got to know that the total population uh, uh, of the 12 tribes had to have exceeded 5 million. And they go from 5 million to less than 50,000 people. And the city of Jerusalem lie in ruins for more than 100 years until Nehemiah came back and began those reforms. We saw last week that the wall was completed in 52 days. We're in the middle of this series uh, from Nehemiah, rebuilding the walls and what can a few do? And we've seen that despite being surrounded by the enemy, Nehemiah has been successful in leading several geopolitical reforms. He ended slavery. He addressed the extreme poverty of the people. And he rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem in just 52 days. You would have thought that the book of Nehemiah would end right there. Now think about it for a minute. Uh, With the completion of the wall, uh, they they would have a a big celebration. It would be like a block party, right? And, and, And... And I mean, God had blessed them and the walls were completed. There would be safety, uh, security inside the city. There would be a huge party. And the book of Nehemiah ends with a celebration. But what is a wall? Let's think about that just for a second. What is a wall? A wall is a geopolitical solution. It's stones on top of stones. And the same wall that keeps the enemy out could also keep the enemy in. Think about that. I mean, what if your neighbor hates you? Is the wall going to help with that? Will it help uh, your, your, your neighbor to suddenly be forgiving? If there's jealousy, will a wall suddenly bring justice? If there's rape, murder, drug use, alcoholism, fractured marriages, disobedient children, will a wall suddenly miraculously give us a drug-free utopia with well-behaved children? <laughs> Good luck with that, huh? I mean, will stones upon stones... Save a society. No. The same wall that keeps the enemy out can also keep the enemy in. And Nehemiah knew, uh, he, he knew this, he understood this. If a wall could not save his people, then what would? A wall may help with morale. But it can't heal a broken heart. Only God can do that. It's like the city's collective heart had stopped beating with all of the transgression over hundreds and hundreds of years of unfaithfulness. And now there's a chance to perform some CPR and revive their hearts. So how, was, how did God revive the city of Jerusalem And that question of how God revived the city of Jerusalem is exactly how He wants to revive us and our city today. Now, you're going to think that uh, this was some stroke of genius. Um, And if you can read the handwriting on the wall, you can see exactly where we are in history today as a nation. And you're going to think that I planned this. I'm telling you, that I didn't plan any of this. And if you see any similarity to what's happening in our society today with what Nehemiah faced, uh, I'm telling you it's, it's not coincidence. It's God's divine providence 
But don't believe for one second that I had anything to do with it because I didn't. But we're going to see this morning how, how God revives a city. And it's not the way you may think. Let's look at that a little bit this morning. I'm going to have to summarize two chapters. And I hope that you're going to go home and, and you're going to read these. Because there, there's, just so, there's just so much here. You know how that, that expression, history, repeats itself? And those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it? I kept thinking that as I was reading these uh, chapters this week. The fact that Nehemiah did not, the book of Nehemiah did not end with the rebuilding of the wall ought to, ought to really tell us something. And here it is. How does God want to revive our city? And the first being, the word of God being lifted up and welcomed in. I mean, look at, uh, look at uh, Nehemiah chapter 8. Just Now, where are we uh, right now? Understand that in Nehemiah, in chapter 8, chapter 8 begins, we are just one week after they finished rebuilding the walls. One week. Wow. Tuesday would be one week after our election, right? But anyway, uh, just uncanny thing, how things work out here. Okay, let's look at, uh, at uh, Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. What does reverence for God's Word look like? Uh, the Word of God was, was lifted up and welcomed in. Look, look at uh, Nehemiah 8, verses 5 through 8. Ezra opened the book, that's Ezra the priest, and all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And all the people lifted up their hands and responded, Amen and Amen. Could I have an Amen? amen. Then they bowed down and they worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God. Now, why is that? Why did they need all those men? It was because the Torah was written in what language? The, the books of the law, the five books of the law of Moses were all written in Hebrew. And now all the people coming back spoke Aramaic. And so they needed uh, somebody to translate the Word of God for them. So they read the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. So what was the effect then of reading the Word of God? Look at verse 9. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teachers of the law, uh, the Lev and the Levites who were instructing the people, said to them, to all of them, they said, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep for all all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. And brothers and sisters, I want to tell you that when we read God's word, it's emotional. It's emotional. All the people were weeping. The, the hard hearts were being broken. And it was a sign that not only was the word of God being lifted up, but it was also being welcomed into their hearts. When's the last time you opened God's word and you wept? over what you heard, or you were convicted by what you read. We may see a nation going one way and God's Word going another. And what's it lead us to do? Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 uh, says that the Bible is different than any other book that we might read. For the Word of God is alive and it's active and it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Every time I read these words, I, I think of back in, in, when I was allowed to go to Russia. And I've shared this story before, but there was a guy who had never even seen a Bible for 70 years. Uh, they had not seen Bibles. The Communist Party burned all the Bibles. And when I met him in 1992 and I gave him a Bible, the man ran down the street jumping and leaping and praising God. He was so excited. Then later, we offered an invitation to accept Jesus Christ. He didn't walk down the aisle. I kid you not. He ran down the aisle. He ran. He ran down the aisle. Then, 
when we went to the Volga River in early May and there were still ice chunks in the river, he ran down to the riverbank and he was stripping off his clothes. Uh, I was grateful that he stopped in his underwear. And he jumped into the river. He leaped, le- leapt, 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 thank you. He leapt into the river. He was so excited. Brothers and sisters, when's the last time we were so excited about opening up God's Word? When's the last time we held God's Word in reverence? We were reminded this last Wednesday that uh, for, for people of, of, of Arab descent, uh, most Muslim, all Muslims, they revere the Quran. <coughs> I made the mistake uh, uh, once of laying, laying the Quran uh, on the floor, on, on the ground. And uh, somebody quickly came over and picked it up uh, and put it on a high, in a higher place. The Word of God is alive and it's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates the heart. It's different than all other books. And it's God's gift to us. It's God's gift to us. It's it's God's love letter to us. And how do we treat it? How do we use it day to day? God gave us this gift, but do we we meditate? Do we meditate on God's Word on a daily basis? It's not just out here, but is it in our hearts? David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. God. If we want our city to be revived, it has to begin with us. And it needs to begin with the Word of God being lifted up and welcomed in. i got to move on. I, don't have, I could talk forever about just that point alone, but I can't. we got to move on. And we, we see that another way that the city was revived is by tents and traditions Making a comeback. And I know this sounds really odd. You're just going to have to bear with me. So we left off in verse 9 with the people mourning and weeping as they listened to God's word being read and taught to all the people. They wept because they realized they had fallen so far from God's holy standard. And Nehemiah and the other leaders were all responding to them the same way by saying, don't mourn, don't weep. This is a holy day to the Lord. And it was. It was the Feast of Trumpets, the, the, the feast that they call uh, Rosh Hashanah. And it was the end of the harvest, which was a call to prepare for 10 days of repentance or uh, days of awe. It was, the, it was leading up to uh, the, day, the, the Day of Atonement. For, for Israel. And if you know, if you know the, the feast of the children of Israel, in, in the book of the law, in the Torah, there were actually seven, there were seven uh, feasts that God set aside. And so there was, the, there was the Feast of Trumpets, and the trumpets were, 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 were blasted, and, and that was like a, a call to prepare. And so then they had 10 days of preparation where the, the people set, uh, set themselves apart. Uh, they, didn't, they tried not to do things that would cause them to be unclean, right? Uh, and, they, they, and so then on the 10th day, they would have the Day of Atonement. And this was a spiritual day where, they, where the, the priest would go into the, to the, to the tabernacle. He would offer sacrifices for all the people. That was that day. And then right after that would begin another feast and it was called the Feast of Tabernacles. So in this month, in this month, uh, the seventh month of the year, they actually had three special uh, events the children of Israel did. Now look at, look at, uh, look at this passage here in verse 10. Uh, we see that, that they're told this is a day of celebration. It was the Feast of Trumpets. And so uh, Nehemiah and Ezra and all the religious leaders, they're saying this is a day of celebration. We want you to eat. We want you to drink. We want you to share with others. This day is holy to the Lord. They said, do not grieve for the joy of the Lord 
is your strength. Everybody say that. The joy of the Lord is their strength. In verse 12, it says they began to celebrate with great joy because now they understood the words that had been made known to them. You see what's happening? They had read the Word of God and they understood the Word of God and, and, and even though it broke their hearts because they knew that they had fallen far from God's standard, yet they said this, they were told this is a holy day. We want you to go and celebrate. We want you to go and, and remember all that God has done for you. Rejoice with one another and share with one another. Share with others. What are we going to do today? We're going to do exactly that. In fact, while they were studying the Torah with Ezra, they realized, they discovered that they had forgotten a tradition. In Leviticus chapter 23, uh, it was the Feast of Tabernacles where they were all supposed to live in tents. And it was like the Israelites lived in tents as they left Egypt with Moses. And it's in Leviticus chapter 23. And it was supposed to be a lasting tradition for the generations to come. The Israelites, every year during that feast, were supposed to live in tents for seven days. They were supposed to go and cut down branches and make tents. They were supposed to do that. And because they had turned their backs on God, they also lost all of these traditions. Look at verses 16 and 17 of chapter 8. So the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs in their courtyards in the courts of the house of God and in the square by the water gate and the one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them. From the days of Joshua son of Nun until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this. And their joy was very great. We see this uh, several times in these uh, two chapters. Their joy was very great. There's a reason why we still do things that Jesus told us to do. Uh, when we do things, uh, let me give you a couple examples this morning. Uh, you know, you think that small groups is uh, maybe... Something I just cooked up out of my head, right? That maybe something I just did in Taiwan and uh, maybe it worked in Taiwan and, and okay, maybe Dave thinks it might work in Detroit kind of thing. How many of you think that? The small groups aren't in the Bible. How many of you think that uh, house groups, you know, groups meeting in homes is, is not biblical, Right? I hope you don't think that because Acts chapter 5 verse 42 uh, reminds us uh, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah from house to house, brothers and sisters, from house to house. The church isn't just the church when we gather here, the church is when we go out there as well. It's there too. But... Talk about traditions for a minute. Of course, we've got Thanksgiving coming. We've got Thanksgiving today. We've got Thanksgiving coming up. It's a time to do what? Give thanks to the Lord to remember how God's blessed us. And that reminds us of how we could be a blessing to others. And then we have Christmas coming. And of course, who doesn't love Christmas, right? Love Christmas. You know, one of the things that we did in Taiwan, which, which, I, which we brought here, was the, the live nativity. And we did the live nativity in Taiwan because nobody knew who Jesus was. In fact, if you said Christmas, uh, they would have, they, most people would have said Santa Claus's birthday. I'm not kidding. And so we, we, we began uh, Christmas, uh, the, the live nativity in, in Taiwan. Boy, what a difference having baby Jesus made. I learned this early on in Taiwan. There was a, a cold, cold uh, Christmas in Taiwan. It didn't usually get cold, but we had a cold Christmas, which meant that we didn't have a, a real baby. And the emphasis immediately shifted away from the baby to all the animals. And, and people, again, lost sight of what 
Christmas means. Jesus sending his only son for us to give his life. But when we had a live baby, they're reminded that God sent his only son in the form of a baby as uh, God's gift to us. The baby that would save the world. Traditions are important. The Israelites had lost their traditions. Uh, they, they had stopped living in tents. And, 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 and it made a comeback. It was such a cool thing. Can you imagine being a kid? Could, could you imagine being one of the kids uh, there in Jerusalem and mom and dad coming home and saying, guess what? The, 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 the Torah tells us that we're supposed to live in tents for a week, you know, out on our rooftop and we're going to pitch a tent up there. And it, Wouldn't it be so cool to grow up as a kid and you would all be sleeping in this little tent and, and mom and dad would be looking up, you'd be looking up at the stars at night and you'd, you'd be reminded of where God promised uh, Abraham that your, your descendants would be like the stars in the sky, so numerous. Things like that. Wouldn't it have been a cool thing? Wouldn't it, can't you see how those traditions uh, each year, how important they would be for the next generation coming along? And when you lose sight of those, what happens? The nation crumbles. And it did. But traditions made a comeback. I, can, I could say more about that too, but I can't. We've got to go on. And then lastly, how was the city revived? It, it was by remembering whose we are and who we represent. All right? So after the seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles was over, in chapter 9, we see the people all gathering together again. Why was that? What had they not done? Remember all those tears that were shed earlier, those tears needed action. And that's what happened. In chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, uh, there was a great revival that began, and it began with re repentance, and it began with confession of sin. Listen to these words, uh, verses 1 and 2. On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. And those of the Israelite descent had separated themselves from all the foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of of their ancestors. The, the people began to pour out their hearts to the Lord and their prayer uh, was the entire uh, chapter 9 of Nehemiah. The entire chapter is a prayer to God. And I'm going to sum up this chapter for us because we just don't have time to read it this morning. In verses 5-8, through eight, we see children of a holy God. Our God is holy and He calls us to be holy as well. And then in verses 9 through 31, we see this call to holiness and a call to worship. We want our city to be revived. We have to know whose we are. We belong uh, to the God of heaven. We belong to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And He calls us to holiness. Brothers and sisters, we have to be different than the world. We have to be different from the world. How will we ever save the world if we join them in doing what the world does? They were called to worship. They were called to prayer in verses 32 through 37. In fact, like I said, this whole chapter was a prayer. Brothers and sisters, uh, I don't know of any great movement of God that hasn't begun with prayer. I was reminded this morning, uh, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed or holy be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's God's kingdom and we're blessed to be a part of it. Any great movement of God has to begin with prayer. And then lastly, the last part of this uh, chapter, we see that the, the, the people of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, was sealed to serve. In view of all this, we are making a binding agreement. We're putting it in writing and our leaders, our Levites and our priests are affixing their seals to it. 
You see, brothers and sisters, they, they, they prayed and they asked for forgiveness and they said, we will follow God. We will follow the Torah. Uh, we'll do what it says. And they didn't just say it. They were sealed. Uh, they, they sealed it. That is, they wrote their names and they, they, they uh, <laughs> in Chinese we say they chopped it. Because everybody has a, a chop, which is an engraving of your family name. Uh, you know, a seal. In ba- you know what I mean? You know, a seal, right? They sealed it. What's our seal today? The New Testament tells us that the Holy Spirit, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And that comes, the Holy Spirit comes when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. As Peter said on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized every one of you uh, so your sins would be forgiven, so that you would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And brothers and sisters, when we give our lives to Christ, we're sealed in Him. Revival can't begin until uh, the Holy Spirit is working in us and through us. So brothers and sisters, what's the real battleground? <laughs> they called the state of Michigan a battleground. I heard that a lot. Didn't, didn't you hear that a lot in the last week or so? Did that surprise you? I don't know. It surprised me. The state of Michigan is a battleground, they said. But brothers and sisters, I think we learned from Nehemiah that the real battleground is not the state of Michigan. The real battleground is the state of my heart. And the state of your heart. And the collective hearts of our city. Remember I asked you to sum up your mood in one word. Did anyone say joy? (laughs) Peg. (laughs) Peg was the one who said joy. Thank you. Not because... Your candidate won. Or because the first thing that he's going to do is do what? Build a wall. (laughs) The real battleground state is not Michigan. But rather the state of your heart, the state of my heart. And does your heart need to be revived this morning? Does your heart need CPR? Will uh, President-elect Trump do it? Will he perform the CPR? Or do you want to revolt so that Hillary can give you mouth-to-mouth? No, brothers and sisters. Obamacare cannot revive your heart. We pray this morning, Lord, revive my heart and may the world see. May the world see that the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. It's not a part a political party. It's not a geopolitical solution. It's the joy of the Lord found in the Word, found in the Word of God in my hands and in my heart. It's found uh, as, we, uh, as we celebrate the traditions like the one we're going to celebrate in a moment, the Lord's Supper. It's by remembering whose we are and who we represent. And only then, then and only then will our Hearts be revived and maybe, maybe will revive our city. When the Holy Spirit has sealed my heart through faith in Jesus Christ, when the Word of God is there and when it's lived out in my life on a daily basis, that's when there'll be joy. And that joy of the Lord will be my strength. I want you all to stand up. Give each other a high five or a hug and look at them and say, The joy of the Lord is my strength.
Right now we're going to sing. And if you have a decision to make concerning your relationship with Jesus Christ, keep coming down, run on down, run on down, and tell everybody that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Let's sing.